Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's special webinar series. Today's topic is on load tap changer condition assessment. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Ollie Benzler, Applications Engineer. Also to assist with question and answer session, we have joining us Dr. Diego Robolino, Business Development Director for Power Transformer Testing, Vince Opitasano, Power Transformer Product Category Manager, and Kenneth Petroff, Power Transformer Product Manager. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Ollie. Thank you very much. So I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, my name is Ola, and I live in Sweden. I work in the Dunderid factory with our transformer products, the Trax, IDAX, and the Frax. Uh, today, we're going to focus on on-load tap changer, and we're going to focus on the electrical tap, meaning the dynamic resistance and the dynamic current. We're going to start with a brief presentation of the on-load tap changer, and then we quickly move into the, the testing, so to say. After that, we look into testing in reality, and finally, we try to look on the results from the measurement we have done. So let's jump right into it. On load tab changer or OLTC, which it will be called, allows us to add or remove turns on our transformer winding and during the load, so to say, during operation. And if we just very quickly look on this simplified equation, we can see that this allows us to modify the voltage on the transformer secondary side. Uh, we will have this very easy module here to the right. We have the primary and secondary side. We have the impedances of the both windings. We have a voltage source injecting current. And then we have the OLTC, which or the regulatory winding represents here the OLTC. Uh, this OLTC can be on either side, depending on which solution you have. Normally, it's located where you have the neutral. If it's on the secondary side, it will have a higher current. And that's most common in the US. Uh, primary side is more common in Europe and throughout Asia. Why you would like to vary this is because the load is varying during the day. So when you have less load on the grid, you want to change, so to say. When you have a high load, the voltage will slack on the secondary side. So the OLTC have taps. And the, so the re regulatory winding is divided into different tabs. Uh, so if we are, here we have, you can see how it can look like. We have different tabs, which different tab position. So each tab position have different number of turns, and that corresponds to different voltage. In the middle of the OT, so you have something called the neutral tab, and then you can normally go up or down, add or subtract turns. Uh, during operation, there are a few things we need to consider. First off, you have to have a constant current. If we want to go from tap one to tap two, which is what you, the tap change allows us to do, current always has to be constant throughout this operation. So we have the make before break. This means that if I would like to go from tap one to tap two, both of them need to be connected before I can leave tap one. And as we also know, there's a voltage difference between tap one and two. So we're going to connect two taps together, which has a voltage drop. This will result in a circulated current. And if we don't control this current, it will be very high. This leads to transition impedance. To be able to limit the circulated current or prevent it, you will need to have some transition impedances when you are in, in between two taps. So. The transition impedance. They can be resistor types, one, two, four, or six resistors, depending on which type of OTC you have. Normally, they are then located on the high voltage side. Another technical solution is the reactor type. Uh, so here we can see the resistor types. We're trying to go from tap one to tap two. 
We have two resistors with limited circulated current. The load current will, of course, tra tra travel through both and can be seen here. The reactor type that's on the low voltage side will have a reactor here, a preventive output transformer. There's something called the bridged position. This is when we have two taps connected at the same time. So for the resistor, we will have here tap one and tap two. We will have a high circulated current because we have this voltage drop between. So IC is a circulated current. The resistor can't handle this stage. So we want to be in this position for as short time as possible. The reactor is completely different. Here is a preventive auto transformer that prevents the circulated current almost completely, meaning a reactor type can work in the bridge position, giving us double the number of tap positions with the same number of taps. Even though we have these transition impedances, the current will still need to be interrupted. And when we interrupt a current, we know from our Faraday law that it will induce a current, so to say, or something will happen. But it doesn't like to break the current. So this interruption can have be in vacuum or non-vacuum. It's the most general classification. Vacuum with vacuum bottles is the most common technique today for newer old pieces, but all the ones do the switching in oil. Here we can just see if we would like here we have that, that the different tabs. We have the transitions here. And if we would like to go from tab one to tab two, our first step would be when we leave this one and only connect our transition resistor. This would mean that the current is interrupted here, and that's when we get this sparking. We will just define a few different key terms. Tab selector. This OTC has two tab selectors, one located in tab number one and one in tab number two. We have the transition resistors. In this case, we have two resistors. We also have the diverted switch, which is making this switching maneuver by going from one to two. We will look into this a bit more detail later, this movement. And this is simplified. And even with this information, we can conclude that there's many different types of OLTCs. And it's important to know what you're testing. It will affect your results and what you can tell from it. Uh, that was just a very quick introduction to the OLTC. In the next uh, part, we will focus on the measurement. So we start with the basic winding resistance test and then go over to the dynamic test and we end with the dynamic resistance measurement. So winding resistance measurement, VRM. This is not a new test to many of you. And you've been doing it. Uh, and this. It's maybe the most basic OLTC test as well, because you're not only testing the, uh, of course, this is the test circuit. We just have a voltage source, apply the current, wait for the current to be stable, then we get the reading. We're not only measuring the wire resistance, we're also me measuring the contact resistance of this diverted switch, the tap selector, the bushing contact, and a modern instrument will also measure the make before break, meaning it makes sure that the current is always continuous when you go from different taps. So the winding resistance test, you also check part of the old uh, And What you then get is when you test all the different taps, is that you get some graphs, which just illustrate what the impedance is for these different tap positions. Uh, the shape of this curve depends on which regulatory winding you have. So here we have a reversing, meaning when we come to the near cross position, we will reverse it. Here we have our coarse winding, and it will look something like that. We will come back to this then when we look on the results later on. And here, nothing is dynamic, nothing is moving. We go from one tap to another and just measure when things are stable. If we want to do the dynamic test, meaning we try to capture this move, movement when we go from tap one to tap two, we come into dynamic current measurement. So we're back at our basic picture of an OLTC, and we're at tap one. We're now going to walk from tap one to tap two, the different steps, and then look how the current will behave. So here, first, we start with the main contact connected, and the main contact will disconnect, and we'll go into a transition contact. 
that will then trigger the diverter switch, which is being operated by a motor, so say that stores it with energy and then releases it. After a while, we'll only have a transition impedance connected. The motion will fall, carry through. We will connect both in parallel. After a while, we will only have uh, transition resistor B connected. Finally, we have arrived at tap two, which is what we aim for. If we just plot up the current during this time, first, it's stable. When we, after a while, when we connect a resistor, the current will drop. When we connect two resistors, the current will be, the, resi the resistance will be less. The current is, drops a bit less or not as fast. And then for B, it's the same as B. And then once we're done, it will climb back to its stable value. So this is, so to say, the dynamic current measurement. We try to measure this current graph during this operation. We can define two key or two, two key parameters here. We will start with the ripple. The ripple tells you how much the current dropped in this transition. So if we would have 100% here and zero here, the ripple will be 95% for this transition. So the ripple is just a measure with how low does the current go, the absolute lowest value. The slope is how fast it's going down, the ampere second, so to say, in the beginning. It's, you can look at other things than the current. You can also, here we still have the same dynamic current graph we had before. It's also possible because when you connect this resistor, the winding, which is fully charged with energy, will try to still push this current through, and that will lead to a voltage, which then will be transformed to the secondary side. So if we would measure the voltage on the secondary side, we can still look on the dynamic voltage graph. It will look something like this, meaning they represent the same thing, but they just look different. It's also possible to do the dynamic resistance, and then we try to measure these resistors. So first it's zero, and then when we have resistor A, A connected, it will go up. When they're parallel, the resistance will go down a bit, and finally back up and then zero again. So these are the three common methods that people are talking about when it comes to diagnose this dynamic movement of the tab change. Uh, so we're going to start a bit, talk a bit more with, about the dynamic current because it's the most common one today. And then we're going to build up to the dynamic resistance measurement. Here we still have the same test circuit. And one discussion when you do the dynamic current measurement is if you should short circuit or open the secondary side. So here we have open secondary side, we can see here. And I do the same tap transition with just different current values. So I use 10 ampere and one ampere. And we can see that the current drops, the ripple, which we just defined how much the current drops, is 27.7% for 10 ampere, but for one ampere, it's much less. So the, it's some kind of current dependence when you have an open secondary side. If we short circuit the secondary side and we do the same tap transition, for 10 ampere, we will have a higher ripple. But we will also see that for one ampere, it's, you still get quite a big ripple, so to say, 52%. Yeah. So, this in some way removes the current dependence a bit from the test. If someone previously tested with five ampere, you can test with 10 ampere and it's much easier to compare the two. But when you short circuit a power transformer, you reduce the inductance. Inductance has a tendency to smooth out the current. So when you short circuit the secondary side of a power transformer and you do this test, the current graph for the shorted version will have much more details in it because the current will not be as smooth due to the inductance. So it's possible to detect more precise faults when you have short circuit the secondary side. Of course, the drawback is that you can't do this static measurement, the winding resistance, because the current will not be stable or it will reach a fault stable. Then we have the dynamic voltage measurement. So, we apply a voltmeter on the secondary side, 
And when the transition resistor is connected, this primary voltage will induce a voltage, which will then be transformed to the secondary side, which will look something like this. First, we have zero voltage. And then when for the first resistor, we get a negative voltage. It will be a bit less. And then it will be even more. And then slowly go back to zero after that. This test, I don't really think no one is using today. But it's still possible to look on the same things that happen inside the power transformer by looking on this side of the power transformer. Then we come to the dynamic resistance measurement. So this is not a direct measurement. It's calculated from the measured voltage of two points and the measured current. So we still have the same circuit, but instead of only measuring the voltage on the secondary side, we measure it on the primary side, our source, and the current we put into the power transformer. And then we use this nice formula. This is the current that we apply, that we measure from the instrument. This is the voltage drop due to the winding resistance. This one we have known from the static measurement. We then measure the voltage on the secondary side, the U2, and transform this to back to the primary side from the transformer nameplate. And if you only have these two parameters, it will not be even, so to say. So part of this induced voltage here, because you connect the resistor, will also be resistive, so to say. It will not only be inductive. So then that's the voltage that is over the old TC, or the, the, res the resistors down here in the old TC. And because we can measure U2, and U and I, we, we can get, we know this voltage over the old TC, and from that we can get the resistance. And then we measure this as a function of time, and we arrive at the resistance graph of the transi transition resistors. First, it's zero. When the first is connected, we measure the resistance. When they're parallel, the resistance goes down. And then we only have the last one. This graph, of course, depends on how many resistors you have. If you only have one, it will not look like this. If you have more, it will look even more jumpy. So what is the advantage with the dynamic resistance measurement compared to the dynamic current measurement? One of the things I didn't talk about, but when I define this ripple, how much the current drops, that ripple is dependent on the current source you use, meaning you can have two different instruments measure the same tap transition with the same current, the ripple will still be different between the two instruments. And this is how this is because most instruments today on the market have low ohmic. They don't have a high impedance for the current source. But they have different. So that's why th this, is, this effect happens. The resistive curve looks the same for all the instruments. So here we don't have this problem because the resistance is still the same. Uh, meaning it's much easier to compare different instruments, uh, measurements from different instruments. Another, of course, big or another thing that you gain is that you get these transition resistor values, which is part of the old TC. And here we will just look, so to say, what happens. Here we have the dynamic resistance graph of a two resistor. Down here we only have one resistor. And we always get, of course, the dynamic current as well, which can be seen here in the red one, because we need the dynamic current to be able to module or, or compute the resistance. Here we can see the timing of things. It's very fast motion. We're talking about milliseconds, so to say. Uh, that was a bit about the theory of the three different pathways, dynamic current, dynamic voltage, or dynamic resistance. Now I intend that we look at what happens when you do this in reality. So we're going to talk about test current, which current you should use during the test, and then how it behaves in our system, or how we do this dynamic resistance machine. So testing current. Here I have tested the same tap transition on the same power transformer, with the same instrument, but at different currents. So here we first have a stable current, and then the tap transition happens, it will go back up. 
we have one ampere and 10 ampere. The first conclusion we can say is that the transition time for the going from type one to two is the same in both cases. So if we would only look on that number, we could not see a big difference. But if you look on the current graph, it looks like something is happening here. You have a lot more bounds, so the current is not, this, for me, this would look quite strange. If you look on the 10 ampere, you don't see any of those effects. So it has been shown by previous uh, people that uh, uh, if you have a too low current, it's sensitive to some contact bouncing and you can get you some fault. You might think there's a problem when there's actually not. Another thing is that sometimes it might be a oil coating. And when you have a very low test current, that can lead to a false interruption, meaning you don't have this make before break condition. So you might think there's a problem. For 10 ampere or 15 amperes, you don't see these kind of effects anymore. And if I would do this for 10 ampere and 15 ampere, the graph would be very, they would be identical. So when you have a too low test current, you run into some problems that you want to avoid. Of course, when you do the winding resistance measurement, you don't want to have a too high current because you will heat the winding. And the same is true here because it's in the same test. So 15% of the rated current is what they recommend for the winding resistance measurement. But besides that, as high as possible is good. So step by step, the instrument that does this for us today is the track system. And here we test step by step. What do I mean with step by step? If we start at tab one, we will start with doing the winding resistance measurement. Once it's stable and we get a reading and we want to go to the next tab, we record these dynamic resistance and dynamic current graphs during the transition. When we then came to tab two, the current will get stable again and we will measure the winding resistance. Then we continue from tab two to tab three and we measure this dynamic resistance again. So it's part of the dynamic of the winding resistance test. We only record the current when we go from one tab to another. Uh, so the dynamic resistance measurement is not a completely new test. Uh, it's just part of the winding resistance test. Of course, one drawback here is that you cannot use the simultaneous winding measurement, meaning if I would test the power transformer, I would test all the tabs on primary and then go back and test only the secondary but with winding resistance. But normally, you only have tabs on one side of the power transformer. The measurement you have left is only one set. So to say. After this test, when we have swept through all the tabs on the diff all the faces of the power transformer, we will end up with a lot of data. We will have the winding resistance for each tab. We will have a dynamic current or the dynamic resistance for each transition. We will have the resistor value of the OLTC that operates. We will have the transition time for each transition from one to two, two to three, and etc. We will have the ripple in each transition. And we can also, if possible, record the motor current for the old pieces. So with just one test, we can collect a lot of data and from a test that everyone is already doing. So my idea now was that I just presented all of those parameters and it might look overwhelming. So now we're gonna go through them together. What do they mean? How would I look at the results? and what problems might be possible to detect. So winding resistance. Winding resistance is not nothing new and this is already being done today by everyone. And an easy way is to plot them in a graph and you place the different spaces on top of each other. That way the eye can quite easily spot what is an outlier. But we also have in the standards which will help us there they define the variation, how to compare the different phases to each other and what is, what's an acceptable level. Uh, but as I said, but this is very well figured out and people accept this kind of measurement. The other parameter is this transition resistance, uh, which is only active during the transition between the two taps, the different taps. And with this resistor value, it's possible to compare with benchmark a test if you've done one of those or with the manual so to say 
of the LTC. And they're normally within a few forms. One, two, maybe up to 12. If you have a problem with LTC, it might be possible to see from this. You can also compare for different spaces, the three different spaces of the power transition. Now we look into the ripple. Uh, the first thing we do with the ripple is that we don't look at only one ripple. We look at the ripple of the whole transition for one, one, one phase. So here we've done 19 tabs, 1 to 19, and we will try to look on all the ripples, so to say. And what's interesting for us is the lower envelope. And with envelope, I mean this, this bottom part, we could always take a straight line here, and then around the neutral, it will be vertical or horizontal. And then on the other end, it will have a straight line again with the same slope. Uh, so here we can very quite see if something looks odd, so to say, it's not following the pattern. Then we will only look on then that transition, for example. Uh, depending on which uh, regulatory winding you have, this pattern will look different. And also go up and down depending on which position you're doing. Uh, so it's good to know what you're testing and how it should look like. Also worth to note that here we can see two different faces on top of each other. And we have a few percent difference, like 30% ripple for one, 29 for the other. Those kind of differences is very small and it's, that doesn't indicate a problem. Uh, also, we can see here that on this x-axis you have time, so around the neutral it will take longer time because the motor needs to operate more times. It's natural. Uh, and if we have 100% ripple, this indicates that we have this break in the current, which is then we have this, but we don't fulfill this make before break criteria. Then we have the transition time, meaning uh, how, how fast the operation happened. We have the total transition time going from one phase to the another, no, from one tap to the another tap. They are usually within 60 milliseconds, but it's different for different types. So 40 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds, uh, it differ. And it's possible to compare this with benchmark or the manual or the different faces, uh, or for other tabs in the same, so to say, because if you have 19 tabs, you're gonna do three times 19 uh, transitions, so then you can compare all of them. But normally, as the old CT get older, the transition time will increase. And as we know that this transition time tell us how long we're in this bridge position, meaning a longer time will mean a longer circulate in current, which will mean more heat being generated. So, but if a spring, for example, would be loose, so not all the energy is transferred, this would maybe be doubled, and that would then indicate a, a serious fault. But it's hard to tell an exact limit because it depends on what is what's expected. But it's good to know that as it, an old piece gets older, it will increase a bit until you do maintenance. And then, if it's possible, so for the resistance type, we have these individual transitions. For the reactor type, we only have the total transition time. I will come back to that later. We also have can look into each transition and look how long each resistor is connected, which might give us an idea. For example, if always the first resistor is connected for a longer time, that might tell us something about that connection, or depending on which old TC you have. But in general, they should be quite similar. But here, for example, we have 29 milliseconds, 16, and 17 milliseconds. So this one is almost double compared to this one, and that will look quite strange. This one, I will go in and look into the dynamic current graph and see what's happening. The number of transitions depends, of course, on the old TC. Here we have two resistors. If we only have one resistor, you get one value. If you have six, you get more each time. Then we have dynamic graph for each transition. So now we look into tap one to tap two, for example. Then we can look on a dynamic resistance graph. What we're trying to find here is continuity and smoothness. How smooth is the curve? We can first see that first it looks quite smooth, and then when we do the transition, something looks that it's happening. 
and we continue the motion. And here, when it should be as go down to zero, it seems to go up again. This will indicate a small bounce. When the bounce is a problem, sometimes it might be hard to tell. There's no clear instructions here, but for me, this would be accepted. Uh, you can also look on the dynamic current because you don't always get the dynamic resistance graph. When it has some reactor type, you only get the dynamic current graph. Of course, they represent the exact same thing. Sometimes it's just much easier to look on one than, than the other. Uh, about these graphs, we said they're very high resolution. You have a very high sampling frequency, so it's possible to zoom in. So if I would look to look closer into this transition when we go from the two parallel to only one, it's possible to zoom in, and then we see we can find some things that happen. So here it looks like we the current is go go down, it's going up again, and then it goes down. So it seems that it's a bit rocky here, some kind of bouncing or happening there. And with this technique, it's possible to find faults that might not be obvious. So when you short circuit the secondary side, this graph will have even more details in them. And then a trained or expert eye can find problems on the graph. You can always compare the different phases or different transitions to each other to see what should be there and what shouldn't. Uh, and of course, the shape depends on the number of resistors, but also which type you have. So this is for a resistive type. A reactor type would look different. So it's important to know what you're testing. Then we have the motor current. So if we have an external motor clamp, we can just record a motor current to, when you do this transition as well. And one key thing here is when the transition is happening. So here we have time zero. We tell the OLTC, and now we want to make a transition. The current will have some initial current or inrush something. will operate, and then it will start to charge up the spring. After a certain time, it thinks, OK, now it's enough energy. Now we should release it. And then, boom, we see the transition happening here. If this transition would happen way earlier, that would indicate a problem, because then the transition time, for example, might be longer because you haven't stored up enough energy. So when the transition is happening compared to the motor current, it can be used to, to determine, so to say, the status of the mechanical inside the, the mechanism of, of the old thesis. Also compare different phases. For some old thesis, you have, for, for some transformer, you have three old thesis, one for each phase then it's even more important to see that they all respond at the same time. Of course, also the current, the value that the motor, the motor is growing has some relevance because the current going into the motor represents the torque, meaning if something is starting to get stuck or if things get heavier for the motor, it will draw a he heavier current. So it's possible to compare this with similar OTCs or previous tests, for example, to see how it's aging. If it's requiring more and more torque, that means that something is getting more harder and harder to move. And now that, that was all the parameters we get from the test. And now we are gonna talk a bit about the reactor OTC because in my part of the world, we only have the resistance type, but I know that in the US, for example, you have this reactor OTC. So first off, we don't have the dynamic resistance graph because First off, you don't have the resistance. You have the preventive output. And we don't, there's nothing for us to record on the, on the other side of the power transformer. But we do have the dynamic current graph. We will have a smaller current drop, maybe one or 2% ripple. If it's much higher, let's say you have 10%, that might indicate a problem with the OLTC. A loose collector ring, for example. So, it's even here, you yes, show the difference. When you test a reactor, you expect a small current drop. A big current drop will indicate a problem or ripple. Uh, and what determines how the dynamic current graph looks is not the resistors. Here, it's the two connectors that when they start to move or when they break or make against the next app, so to say, that will show up in the dynamic current graph. But then the same thing applies, so to say. You can see how that contact, how smooth it looks, and et cetera. 
you have a slower transition time because the reactor will operate in a bridge position, so time is not as important. Here it takes some seconds to perform the transition. So maybe it's not as relevant to, prefer to look for these milliseconds, but you will still, if you have three phases, they should be quite similar between them. If one is taking double the time, it might indicate a problem, but in general, it's a slower transition time. And the winding resistance graph will not be as smooth because in the bridge position, you might have a different resistance compared to a non-bridge. So because the reactor can operate in the bridge position, position, it's important to remember that. And if you would like to do a benchmark, the reactor will see that it's more sensitive if you go from one to two or from two to one. It's also true for the resistive resistor type synthesis, but for the reactor, it's even more clear. So if you would like to do a benchmark measurement, it's good to go up and down because else it might be hard to compare. Uh, it also so to say that the diverter switch can operate back and forward. So each even tap might be in one direction of the inverter switch, diverter switch, and the other in the other direction. This is also true for the resistor. App, uh, types. So it's useful to test up and down for both, but for reactor, it's maybe even more important. That now I have one thing more just to try to confuse you, and that's how the instrument itself is working. So let's say you're used to one instrument and go to the next instrument. And one thing that's important to note is that depending on how this instrument operates, it can look a bit different. So if I would like to do the winding resistance measurement, I can select 10 amperes and the instrument will achieve the 10 amperes and then it will do the measurement. Or I can select, I want 20 volts. So depending on what the instrument is regulating on, it can look a bit different. The track system regulates current as well as some of our competitors, but I know other that regulates the voltage. Uh, and then the envelope of the ripple that we talked about we look different depending on what you regulate on. So when we regulate the current, the top envelope is constant. We always have 10 ampere up here. So here we don't find anything of interest. We're looking down here. When you regulate the voltage, this is not true anymore. The top envelope, I can't show a picture of that because my instrument doesn't do that, but I know I've seen these pictures. Then the top envelope is not constant anymore. It will more look like an inverse V. Uh, so this just means that you can look, measure, if you have done a previous measurement and you come with a different instrument, the shape might be completely different. And this is then a possible explanation, I think, to just remember. Uh, but there's some differences in how the instrument manufacturer shows to regulate. And that will have a bit of an effect when you look on these macro pictures. Uh, and that was what I intended to to you. So I will just give you a few things to take with you. First is that there are many different types of OLTCs, so it's important to know what you're testing. The OLTC has its own nameplate or it's on the nameplate, so you can always see what the nameplate is saying and from that you know a bit more what you're testing. Also from experience, from looking at the graphs, for example. Uh, the dynamic resistance measurement test or dynamic current is not an extra test. We do it at the, at the same time as we do the winding resistance measurement test. So we're not adding a whole lot extra time to the testing. You just need to record the current when you do the transition. So the time is very con similar to only doing the winding resistance test, but you get a lot of extra data from the test. The, uh, so I talked about maybe a lot of the parameters you get, and it might be hard to see, but in general, the eye is very good at spot outliers, meaning a lot of these faults you can just find by looking at the graph. You don't have to be an expert where you can zoom in on the graph and find these details. A, a, a lot of, so to say, a good way to get started is just to know this, that a lot of the problems can quite easily be detected if we just look on the transition time. One is one phase, double the transition time. Oh, something must be wrong there, for example. And of course, you can always ask for help and it might be possible to figure out the problem together if we, and that way we both will learn. So I encourage you to ask for help and send, send data or, and we will always assist you. 
And that's what, what I had to say. Thank you very much for taking your time and hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you, Ollie. So at this point, uh, the presentation portion of our webinar has officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. For those of you who have questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. If you're leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a quote or demo of any mega products. A copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view recordings of previous webinars on our website at us.megar.com webinars and register for our next webinar on this cable condition assessment with VLF and PAN Delta testing. The presenter will be Javier Ruiz this upcoming Monday. All right, let's jump into your questions. The first one is going to be for Vince. Vince, Michael? can we? Yes. Michael, uh, before mm -hmm. we jump into questions, uh, there's a still a uh, little bit of information that we wanted to share with the group. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll leave it to you. Then. Things, yes. One of the things that we wanted to, to highlight is that there's, of course, uh, many references that have been published on uh, talking about dynamic resistance, maybe not to talk about dynamic resistance, or, but this is a dynamic testing process to be to be looking into not just the static condition of our, of our tap changer, but also the dynamics in the transition process of the of the tap changer. And we suggest, for example, one of the publications that, that we consider is, is really important to highlight it, the differences that we have between dynamic voltage, dynamic current, and dynamic resistance per se, is the one that we have right now on the screen, right? So if you guys are interested in this type of information, I encourage you to go into the IEEE Explore website, right, and, and download this info, this uh, publication. Uh, it's it's very informative related exactly to, to what uh, Ulle has tried to uh, to convey today on the information during the webinar. What is the dynamic voltage? What is the dynamic resistance? What is the dynamic current? How these methods differ one to the other? What is the application of each one? Uh, what can you see on the dynamic uh, uh, transition process for a resistive type top changer or a a reactive type of changer. If, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we, of course, want to highlight the importance of the product that Megar has for this type of operation. And TRAX is a state-of-the-art technology that is not just transformer testing, but it's also a substation test set. One of the big advantages that we have with TRAX is that the, the implementation of a basic functionality for transformer testing and an advanced functionality of transformer testing makes it uh, the perfect solution when you're uh, in the field, especially if you're trying to troubleshoot any problem in the in the substation while, while you're doing the testing. Everything is interesting when you have good results, but if you have a bad result and you need really to get into the details of why is that coming up, then of course it's, it's important to have a unit like Trax, which is basically a, a portable laboratory to bring to the field and, and look into every single detail, especially with the application of the manual control function that will allow you to do basically all the testing uh, on the manual mode. It's not uh, the unit or, or simply a, a, a test sequence that is given to you. You understanding the physics of the equipment that you are testing and all the advantages that you have on the metrology of the tracks unit will be able to troubleshoot in a better way and you have a, a things like an oscilloscope and things like that that will allow you, of course, to do a cost saving, right? Uh, having one instrument that is really uh, a leader uh, when it comes to troubleshooting of power transformers in the field. And I want to uh, have a minute also for Ken. He will show us a little bit on the other equipment that is related to winding resistance measurement. Yes, thank you, Diego, and thank you, Ole, for the presentation here today, and thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, as Diego was explaining, the dynamic resistance, dynamic current, dynamic voltage is all a very um, in-depth analysis of your on-load tap changer, um, but each of our winding resistance instruments comes with uh, some base level uh, functionality that helps you diagnose the tap changer uh, each of the instruments displayed on the screen 
um, has features built in to automatically uh, shut off the test current if there is a significant drop in current that exceeds uh, 200 milliseconds or some similar type value. So if there is a um, you know, sort of catastrophic failure with your onload tap changer, each one of the instruments uh, displayed here will be able to catch that and alert you to, to that failure. Um, in addition, the MTO 210, 250, 300, and MWA, they each have uh, make before break detection that is quote unquote a soft make before break. So this is where you can set your make before break limits to you know five milliseconds or 20 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds where uh, the test set will not discharge if that um, time limit is exceeded, but it will alert you to a potential problem. So if you're going through your 33 tap uh, OLTC and you see that you know tap 14L uh, had a soft make before break where the transition time uh, exceeded your set value of 20 milliseconds, then you would know to, to go back and perhaps you want to do a dynamic resistance measurement on that uh, to, to see exactly what's going on. So uh, whether you have the latest and greatest in the tracks or you have one of our uh, other instruments, you will find uh, some OLTC testing capabilities that would be uh, a little bit simpler, but you know that's sort of your first line of defense uh, when you're trying to uh, isolate these problems. And the dynamic resistance, again, is more of an advanced test where if you're truly trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, uh, that'll help you do that. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. So since I uh, went over a lot beforehand and kind of uh, sandwiched in the information, we'll jump into the question section now. Um, so Vince, uh, our first question is going to be for you. Can we put tap changer on low voltage windings? Uh, yes, of course. Um, tap changers can be on either high side or low side. We typically use uh, low side a reactive type or what is called a preventative auto type OLTC and in that case it is the uh, it is not using resistors and as such we, we use a different technique for determining the condition of the uh, load tap changer but yes we absolutely do and can right yeah thank you um, Diego our next question is going to be for you is dynamic resistance the same as step resistance, i.e. step resistance can also give value of change in resistance from one tap to another? Uh, thank you for the question. I think that maybe the question is related to what we call make, make before break, or I, I'm not quite sure about the, uh, the, the step resistance uh, definition exactly, but when we're talking about make before break when we look at the transition itself that is being that is being performed uh, with dynamic resistance like you were looking at the information provided uh, there is basically three approaches to this and one is uh, of course the dynamic current dynamic voltage and dynamic resistance applicable to resistive type reactors and the beauty of this is to look at the resistive values okay all right um, Vince, our next question is for you. What test current is acceptable for an OLTC? Is there a limit? Well, that's, uh, again, one of those questions which gets asked uh, quite often as to what currents. There, there are some limits for test currents, uh, and that's set about by the rating, the current rating of a, of a winding on the high side or on the low side if we're doing the testing. And as uh, Oli had mentioned uh, in the presentation, if the test current is too low, we have one condition where, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, too low, you, you see what are a bit of a nuisance um, type condition, and you don't know if it's a problem or if that is an actual condition. And so when uh, in that example, Oli had raised the test current to I think 10 amps, then that problem appeared to show itself as not being there and that the uh, low tap changer operated as normal. So other than 
uh, not exceeding the limits of the particular rating of the winding, high side or low side, um, we typically, and this is just myself, I typically pick a 10 amp or somewhere thereabouts, 15 amp uh, test current uh, for, for performing these types of tests as a maximum. If we go too high, there are other problems apparent. Some OLTC manuals indicate that you shall not use DC test current above a particular parameter when performing testing. And so we need to read that manual before we proceed. But the 10, 15 amp DC, uh, in my opinion, becomes a very useful um, test current for this type of work. All right, thank you, Vince. Um, Diego, our next question is for you. When would be a reason you would have to perform a dynamic test on an OLTC system? Well, there might be different reasons for performing an, uh, a dynamic test on the OLTC. Let's uh, let's go back to what uh, Ken uh, indicated during uh, his uh, his part of the presentation. You you have certain routine tests that are specified in the different standards, and especially during commissioning and installation, uh, you will go and will perform like winding resistance tests, like uh, leakage reactance tests, and tone ratio tests, right? And every single piece of test will add information to the condition of your LTC. On the dynamic and uh, more advanced technology that we have, for example. Uh, you can correlate dynamic resistance to the application of SFRA technology, and you will see that you need to have a benchmark. It's better to have information like Ole was presenting during, uh, during his uh, presentation right now. He indicated the importance of having reference information on the condition and the dynamics of your LTC, because as a mechanical component, right, and a, a mechanical component that is always in operation, right, the mechanical, the mechanical um, structure itself may tend to, to degrade and may tend to, you know, suffer some uh, aging, deterioration, whatever that is, or contamination that will lead to observations on the dynamic process itself. So having a benchmark, ha having a little bit of a reference will be good. So if you can perform that test uh, from factory to have that during commissioning, and uh, you can include that as part of your uh, routine processes because it's very easy to to look at the information. Actually, when you perform winding resistance tests, you can see at the same time the, the dynamic resistance values, right? If you have the uh, proper technology for that. And like uh, we, were, we were looking at the presentation, there's uh, different conditions on, on which you can do winding resistance and dynamic resistance at the same time. Not, not always the case, but it's, it's a possibility. So if you have the possibility and it's taking you the same time as doing winding resistance, then why not? Okay, and if you did just winding resistance, or you did SFRA, or you did uh, turn pressure testing, and something becomes doubtable on the result, uh, it is strongly suggested to go into the OLTC testing part. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Vince, can the OLTC testing presented be used on three phase voltage regulators? Yes, in fact, the uh, three-phase voltage regulators are commonly used on transmission line systems. And as such, uh, they are probably, during the loading cycle of the day, uh, working very hard or, or transitioning throughout the day, at least through the load cycles. And the only difference being that you would, in, in the case of what we're doing, is record each one and then superimpose uh, the three on top of each other if you wanted to look at a comparison. But with the track system, the nice uh, portion of it is that you can compare the resistances of each to what the they are. Even if you didn't know that the low tap changer resistance was X value or Y value, you compare A to B to C. And so a three-phase voltage regulator would, would give you a very clear indicator of the comparisons of uh, what you should expect. So there, there should be no reason not to use it quite effectively. All right, thank you, Vince. Um, Ken, our next question is for you. Uh, 
You discussed OLTC, but do you have any suggestions for DETC? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, so this is about what's in a name. And if you look at what OLTC stands for, it stands for On Load Tap Changer. DETC stands for De-Energized Tap Changer. So uh, the suggestion when testing DETCs is to never have them energized when you are testing and you change the tap. All right, thank you. Uh, so Vince, could you give more details about site applications between resistor type OLTC and reactor type OLTC? Which one is com uh, commonly preferable? Well, there, there's that question about uh, where do you live? Um, and if you live here, this is what's typically used. What I've experienced of doing this for, I guess, 40 years, I always thought when I was starting in testing that all load tap changers were reactive. I didn't know there existed a resistive type. And as I came to different parts of the world, and I, I lived in Canada for most of my life, then I found that the other areas were using resistive type. And so the resistive type are when we regulate the high side system voltage and the um, reactive type are on the low side because we're regulating on the low side or the distribution side um, of a system. As far as which one is preferable, the nice thing about reactive type is that they don't you don't need as big a resistor uh, because we have very high currents on the low side in certain cases and resistors would consume quite a lot of power and transitioning would be not as practical and so using a reactive type is very nice but what we're finding at least in, in my experience is that more and more of our customers throughout North America are using resistor type as well as reactor but they're moving towards it. In rest of world, uh, Asia, uh, Europe, it's commonly uh, known that only resistive types are used. And so they do not know anything about reactive types. And I found many times I've had to explain what a reactive type was. They had never seen it in all their years of uh, uh, operating systems. I hope that uh, gives you at least some idea of which one is preferable. Uh, it just depends on your system. You can't simply change a low, a low side OLTC to a high side OLTC. There has to be a utility direction to do so. Thank you, Vince. Uh, Ole, uh, the next question will be for you. I understand that yeah. these tests are performed with AC power source and not DC, as opposed to transformer winding resistance tests. If that is the case, then we measure impedance of the equipment and not the resistance. Could you please elaborate on this? Yes. So the winding resistance test and the dynamic resistance test is the exact same test. We only record a current during the transition between the two tabs, meaning we use a DC source, of course. What, why the current is changing over time is because we have this inductance. So we have a current that changes over time because we are dealing with resistance and an inductance. But the measurement setup is the exact same for winding resistance. So as I explained that we go do winding resistance with tap one, and then when we do the tap transition from one to two, that's when we do the dynamic resistance graph. Meaning you don't do any reconnections or anything. You have the exact same connection. So you just test through it. So we use a DC source. Thank you. Uh, while I have you, Oli, the next question will be also for you. Uh, the tracks, what is the maximum frequency output of that unit? So on the tracks, I think we have 10 outputs or something. So it depends which output you're using. For the Tangens Delta, we can go up to 505 hertz. Also for the frequency response of stray losses, we go to 505 hertz. But for example, uh, 800 ampere might be harder to run at th that high of a frequency. But the maximum is 505 for the basic outputs. All right, thank you. Additionally, Ole, 
Uh, how does the dynamic measurement affect the transmission of the motor shaft to the charger or to the changer? Sorry. Uh, do you have any examples that you can show us? Oh, so, uh, maybe it's hard to me to show an example now, but maybe I can come back to you if you send an email. But in general, the dynamic resistance test doesn't affect us to anything. We only the tap stage change is operating as it do normally, but there's no load current on it. So the motor shaft will of course rotate to make the transition happen, so to say. So this is what we try to measure, uh, the, the transition time and etc. Also with the motor current. So we try to diagnose the whole old TC. And that's include the motor and the gearbox for the motor, so to say. Uh, but uh, I, I can show you some examples with that. If you give me, send in your email. Okay, good deal. Uh, so moving on, Ken, is there any temperature correction method when performing uh, measuring winding resistance? Uh, when performing winding resistance, yes. Um, if you know the temperature of the winding, which of course you can uh, use the gauges on the transformer to, to look at the top oil, bottom oil, get the average uh, to determine what the temperature of the winding is. And then you know the winding material, whether it's copper or aluminum. Um, you know, every uh, test set that's out there that performs winding resistance will um, have a place for you to enter in what temperature uh, you want to correct to. So the tracks or the MWA or the MTO, you can put in that winding temp and what temp you want to correct to, whether that's 85 or 75. I believe it's dependent on the uh, the the nominal like operating specification of that transformer, whether you correct to 75 or 85 degrees C, but we there are provisions within the software that allow you to to correct for that winding resistance measurement. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Diego, what is the impact of tap load changing on the life cycle of the transformer? Uh, well, that is an interesting question. On the tab load changing or the tab load changer. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, if you look into the information provided by, say, Seagray, right, in one of the latest documents of technical brochures that came out, and they look into the reliability of power transformers, they see that especially high voltage bushings and LTCs are some of the biggest issues that we have when we talk about failure of power transformers. So it, it is quite important for us to understand the condition of, of our power transformer from the electrical, electromechanical point of view, from the dielectric point of view, from the thermal point of view. So all these combined, right, is what really gives us a, a clear uh, a clear vision of the condition of our, of our transformer and we can make some assertive uh, decisions on what to prioritize when it comes to maintenance and, and, and operation itself. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, so Vince, uh, how frequent does the OLTC need to be tested in every, uh, does it need to be tested every two years or three years? Is there a standard to weigh in on this? Um, no, this, this is a relatively new test and as such, there, there is no, let's say, frequency in which to do it. And like, I, I'm an older um, tester, and so I've got my old methods. I do believe that there are basic winding resistance tests that you must at least do first, and those are depending on the type of transformer you have. If this transformer is critical and important, that determines the frequency. Um, doing it every two or three years is depending on that to me is a very critical transformer. We may want to go into longer cycles like three years and five years for testing. And as such, the nice thing with the tracks, if, if one is using the tracks, is that while doing the winding resistance, we can record the dynamic resistance as we're performing the test with very little additional time. We don't even have to use it. We just simply record it and we note at least level one. What is the winding resistance? Compare the three phases, yes, they're good. Compare the simple static graph, yes, they're good. And we're done because we don't have enough time on an outage to always do all of this. Some guys will have lots and lots of time and yes, you can do it. But otherwise, I, I, I would say from 
you know, until we find more and more information, that the need to investigate this is a matter of the criticality of the transformer. Thank you very much, Vince. Um, Diego, can you use the Trax unit on a ter uh, tertiary transformer with an OLTC? As you can see, to have a an OLTC on the tertiary or on the secondary side is is basically the same thing if we consider that we will play between primary and secondary or primary and tertiary or secondary and tertiary. So basically for the methods, the way that the Ole was explaining during the presentation, you can see that you are working with two windings, right? One has to be the, the, the one that uh, receiving the signal, the other one is measuring the signal. And by saying this, yes, it's like uh, doing, again, another winding resistance test, right? If you have a tertiary winding and you need to test it, you just do it. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So Vince, do we perform the same test on OLTC as we do with the DET? Uh, DETC versus OLTC, yes. Um, th this gets asked if someone has not really gotten a lot of experience in the uh, tap changer testing. Um, the DETC sometimes is never even exercised on transformers. If they're smaller types, some utilities have a mandate that says do not touch the switch because once an offload tap changer is set, it typically never gets used again. And so they don't do it. If you were to try to um, test a DETC, an offload with an onload test, you will actually create problems on your potential problems on your DET, on your offload tap changer switch, because it's not meant to take load. And anyone here who's been in electrical work, there's something called a load break switch versus just a switch. A load break switch can handle a load and can turn off a load, whereas a regular switch would blow up or, or arc over and fail uh, soon after it was uh, exercised. And so there is a very big difference in those two. And one, if one is not sure in what they have, don't do any testing until you find out clearly what type of uh, device you have on which side of the transformer. And not everyone knows because it's not important until you need to know. All right, thank you, Vince. Uh, while I have you, is there a trend from the OLTC manufacturer side that pushes production to be of the reactive type and not the resistive type? No, uh, so, and I've dealt, and I'm, I'll use a brand name, Reinhausen, uh, they're a group that I've been involved with on and off over the years, and they don't like to um, slant one side or the other. What they want is what works best for a particular utility or a large customer. And so I, I can tell you today, when I learn about reactive type, I'm one of the few who understands reactive type. Why? Because there's less reactive type than there are resistive type. And the resistive type give us numerous examples of, excuse me, advantages over reactive type. But if you have a system that's that's got the low side tap changer, which is typically reactive type, then you're not gonna simply switch. And so we must understand and be able to help them effectively. So manufacturers simply want to support what is best for the customer and they don't uh, do that as far as trending they don't even recommend you test tap changers that that's the last i remember speaking with uh, manufacturers they say they're so good you never need to test them of course that's their statement they're selling oltcs to the transformer manufacturers uh, we are selling test equipment, so we're going to tell you to always test. And so which one? I believe each case uh, has value and, and should be determined on its own merit. All right, thank you. Um, Ole, is, uh, what is the limit value for Ripple? So the Ripple is depending on several things. First, the instrument, as I 
of the current social instrument, but also the relationship between the inductance of the power transformer and as well the the resistance you, you connect to it. So, for so, and also if it's a reactor type, for example. So, for a re reactor type, the limit would be much lower than for a resistive type. But there are no, so say, real limits because it will look different depending on w w what what you're testing. But it's important to compare the phases or between the phases on the same power transformer on each transition. If you have this envelope, so to say, where things sort of seem to be sticking together, that might indicate that a high ripple might be fine. But if you have like outliers that you clearly see, so it's hard to put like 50%. If it's that like catastrophic, well, maybe not. But of course, 100% percent ripple is that you have no current and that's a big problem but you cannot say exactly one value because it's different for different transformers and also the instrument you have will affect it so it's hard to say all right thank you guys and thank you all for attending uh thank you to our panelists for helping out with our q a session and ole for taking some time out of his day to present uh to us it looks like that's all the time we have for Q&A, unfortunately. We do apologize if we didn't get to your question today, but we will be following up with you in the next couple of weeks. But uh, once again, thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to uh, answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But I'd like to uh, wish everyone a great weekend, and I hope to see you all at one of our upcoming webinars. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone.